Okay, we're going to take what we did last time and build from it. Um, build something maybe a little more purposeful um, than simply showing spoilers. Although, you know, there's, there's ways that you can actually uh, implement that functionality um, to, to uh, you know, be effective. Let's say you had a self-quiz, you know, on a, on a website where you could ask students questions and they could click to see the answer. That way they could test themselves, sort of as a study tool. So even the, the simple example we had last time, I mean, there's, there's reasons that you could, you could use it to uh, add something to the page. All right? The key thing to remember, again, is that we're going to deliver all the HTML. We're going to deliver all the CSS. We might hide things. We might make things look different. But we can always change that via our JavaScript. So the example we had last time was to show spoilers. We did it a couple different ways. We did it based on a mouse on, uh, over and mouse out. We did it on a button click. And then we wrote a function to do several of them all at once. So let's take a look at that, and then we'll go on to the next example. Well, the first one we covered first, we had an on-click event. Remember that there are events, and they typically represent user actions, and they're, they are what is going to initiate the JavaScript. So. What this means is when the mouse is clicked, I want to do this snippet of JavaScript. All right? And we have that in a couple of other places as well. We have that on the mouse over. We have that on the mouse out, on the link. And we have it on this button. Our JavaScript instruction... Uh, in this case, there's only one instruction. Now, keep in mind that this is just, you know, we're just sort of learning to crawl here. So you're typically going to have, you know, more than one instruction. But here, the instruction is to, first of all, point at the thing that we want to change. All right? There's all these elements on our HTML page. We have to point to the one we want to change. And in this case, we want the thing that has the ID of spoiler1. And that's what document get element by ID means. It points to that thing. And then we define what about that thing we're interested in and what about that thing we're going to change. We're going to change something about the style of it. What are we going to change about the style? We're going to make the visibility of it visible. All right? So... Initially, the CSS is set up to make the visibility of everything with the class of spoiler as hidden. We then, when you click on it, we set the visibility of the thing that has an ID of spoiler1. We change the style, and we set the visibility to visible. We do the same thing here on mouse over and mouse out. So the same um, action except we trigger the action a different way based on putting the mouse over and the mouse out of this particular link. Finally, whenever we have multiple JavaScript instructions, it often benefits us to write a function for them because then we can give the multiple statements a name and do all of them all at once. All right? Instead of having a instruction after instruction after instruction, which clutter the code. By neatly separating things, that's good for a number of reasons. We can then go and we could put that in an external JavaScript file, just like we did in an external CSS file. And we have the advantage of we could uh, make it such that we could share this little snippet of JavaScript between pages. Okay, we're going to do a very simple mouse over, uh, menu mouse over thing. All right? And we're going to do that uh, by implementing one sort of step at a time. Remember, we have the three tools. Each tool brings something different to the party. All right? We have our HTML. 
which is the content and sort of the logical organization of the page. By logical organization, I mean how things are grouped together sort of conceptually. That's related to, but not the same as the physical layout. The logical layout says we have a head. We have a nav. We have a header, rather. We have a nav. We have a footer. We have three sections. That's how things are grouped together. The physical layout would say something like, well, the header is on the very top of the page. The nav is on the left side of the page. The sections are stacked up in a grid. And then finally, the footer is at the bottom of the page. That's the responsibility, again, of CSS, that and any other aspect of the appearance. And then finally, the behavior, the interactivity, is what comes from JavaScript. So I'm going to create a real simple menu example. And we'll build it up from the ground up. JavaScript and CSS. We're just going to start with HTML. Now, I'm going to put this in a nav section because, again, that's what a nav section is, right? It's your menu. And we could do a lot of things with this and we'll play around with this a little bit. Um, I'm not going to spend a tons of time making like a perfect page layout, but I'll do a little bit just to show you sort of how this fits in context. So I'll put a header in and a footer and a section just so that we have a, a complete web page and not just parts of a page. Question, is Greek text acceptable uh, on your final project? No. Okay. Is Greek text acceptable on a prototype? Yes. Okay. Um, occasionally, you know, I'll hear people say, well, you use Greek text. It's like, well, yeah, and uh, if I were grading myself, I would have taken off points for it. here and I'll do a little bit with the CSS of it in a second but I want to start the menus. So menus essentially are unordered lists. That's how we're going to put our navigation in, right? That's typically how we've been doing it. Because a menu, you know, there's nothing definite about the ordering of the pages in your navigation. You could rearrange them without destroying the meaning. All right? It probably makes sense to have the home page your first, uh, your first link, but the rest of the page is really, you know, you, you have choices, you have options. So I'm going to make an unordered list of links. So, 
not actually making all these different pages, so I'm just going to use an href of pound just so that I have an href. And so I'll make three menu items. Now, for each menu item, I'm going to make a submenu. And I'm going to put the submenu in its own list. Now, we can probably figure out, all right, that we're going to want the submenu to have a class and an ID. Why do you suppose I'm going to want the submenu to have a class and an ID? To control its visibility. To control its visibility, right. So initially, I'm going to use a class to make all the submenus invisible, all right, rather than having to define each ID individually. So I'm going to give a class of submenu. But when I'm going to do my mouse over menu, I'm going to want to display one specific menu item and only one specific menu item at a time. All right. Therefore, I need to point to the specific submenu I want to show. All right. So therefore, I'm going to need uh, a ID so I can point to that. So, I'll give a class of submenu. And an ID of submenu1. do that for each of each of the submenus. three menu items and there each menu item has its own sub menu. So, yeah, go ahead. The third one doesn't have the constant ID. Repeat that please. Uh, the third uh, Ah, right. Thank you. I forgot the UL tag. HTML for this page, right? We have our navigation with three link items on the main menu, and this, each one has a submenu. We then have our header, body, or section, footer. Let's go and look at this. And here we go. That's how it looks like. Okay. We can then go and style this. Uh, any way we want to, all right, um, which uh, I'm going to go in and uh, I'll just put some simple styling in. Again, I'm putting it in the same HTML file just out of laziness. This isn't a recommendation that you do it this way. 
So I'm going to say header with hundred percent float left. Nav with twenty percent low left section and footer. And I should have footer on the top, or footer on the bottom, header on the top, and the nav to the left side, and the section next to the nav. So that's what I have. All right, that's good enough for now. We'll save that. Actually, we'll make the nav a little bit wider. CSS to get the menus to work. Hide the submenus. So, I could do this a couple different ways. Remember, I could do a visibility hidden or display none. Last time I did a visibility hidden to sort of highlight the fact that there was something missing, right? But here, I don't think it will make a, a good sense to do that. So, I'm going to say, I'm going to say display of none so that it takes up no space at all. And what's my style rule going to be? Dot submenu. Okay, dot submenu. In other words, everything with the class of submenu, I'm going to make the display none. All right. So there we go. Yay. All right. Now. What do we want to do when we put our mouse over this item, menu item one? Display submenu sub one. So, what is the element I want to interact with? The element I want to interact with is this link. All right? Or, it could be this li. I'm going to do, I'm going to put it on the, well, we'll do it both ways. We'll see if we get a difference. So I'm going to say on mouse over equals, I have my double quotes. All right, what am I going to do to point to that submenu? Pardon me? Right, document, get element by ID, and remember the capitalization is important. What thing do I want? I want the thing that has an ID of submenu1. What do I want to change about it? I want to change something about the style. Uh, what do I want to change about the style? I want to change the display. And I want to set the display to probably black or inline. Okay, so where was each display? I'm going to change it to black. Semicolon and then and. So, document. I'm going to change something on the web page. What am I changing on the web page? I'm changing the thing that has an ID of submenu 1. What am I changing about it? I'm changing the style. 
What about the style? I'm changing the display property. What am I setting it to? I'm setting it to black. All right, so I'm zeroing in. Each, each dot in there takes it a little, more for, a little further, a little more specific. So I start out with document. I'm going to change something on this page. All right, that's not terribly descriptive, but it's necessary. What am I going to change on the page? I'm going to change the thing that has an ID of submenu 1. Well, there's a lot of attributes associated with the thing that has a submenu of 1, right? It has a background color. It has a, a font. It has content. There's all kinds of things that have that, that are characteristics of the thing that has a, the, the ID of submenu 1. So I have to say specifically what do I want to change. Well, I want to change an aspect of its style as opposed to an aspect of its HTML. And what do I want to change about it? I want to change the display property. And what do I want to set the property to? I want to set it to block. So again, these are values. These are variables or objects or properties or that sort of thing. These are included in single quotes because we use a double quote to go around the entire uh, JavaScript statement. So let's see if this works. Oh, Internet Explorer is, is afraid that there's some security issue, so I'm going to say, okay, it's allowed, you're allowed to run this. I accidentally clicked to run this in Internet Explorer instead of Chrome like I usually do. So I put my mouse over it, and it appears. Pretty cool, huh? Yay. All right. Now, I want to do that to the rest of them. So, if I take my mouse out of that, I want to make it disappear. So I'm going to go on mouse out. And set the property. Same thing. The only difference is going to be the value I'm setting that property to. I'm going to set the property on mouse out to none. users. Just kidding. I go and hover my mouse over that. I go down to click that submenu. It disappears. Well, it's doing what I said, right? I take my mouse off of this guy, it makes it disappear. So how are we going to fix that? We are going to put the same thing on this UL. If the mouse is on the UL, keep it there. All right? Keep it visible. So there you go. Um, do we need to put it twice on both? You need to put it on both. You need to make it appear. And then if the mouse goes over the other element, you need to keep it showing. Otherwise, it does exactly what it did where you put your mouse on it and it disappears because the on mouse out took effect. Now, one thing you have to be aware about this is depending on the style that you have on things, if there's a little tiny gap, let me, let me deliberately break this and say li, no, what do I want to do? UL. Margin. Top five pixels. I made a mistake. I'll go back and correct it. Margin dash top five pixels. Because there's a little tiny gap there, 
I can't it I can't move my mouse fast enough to get it over the other one to have that one's kick in. So as soon as the mouse goes into the gap between them, it's sort of in a no man's land, and in which case it's going to make it um, uh, disappear. Now, I might be able to get rid of this. This is where I said I'd try it both ways. If I do this, if I put the on mouse over and on mouse out over the LI. Then I don't think I have to put it on the UL because that UL is still part of the LI. So even with the gap. All right. So again, it's sort of critical. All these things work together, the HTML, the CSS, and all that. I can do that and I can simplify my code a little bit because that LI, the submenu, is part of the uh, main menu's LI. Okay, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what else would you like to change? Like if we had like a color background color or whatever. Sure. And uh, yeah, let, let's go and let's change. Um, and then like in a single statement or do you have to write a specific <coughs> statement for each one of them? You'd write a specific statement for each one of them. So... Trying to think of a good example. I'll put on mouse over. This is whatever object it's on. So this means this li in this case. So I'm going to say this style um, dot background color. Remember, in CSS, we say background dash color. So in JavaScript, we say background color with no dash, but with a capital C. Um, let's make it yellow. So yeah, we can write a statement to do that. Not equal to yellow. No, you're right, equal to yellow. I got confused between CSS code and JavaScript code. So now... I didn't put it back, so to complete this, I probably should go and set it back. Because once you set it, it stays at until you write the code to reverse it. this up? Well, it's just more of the same, right? That's sort of the neat thing about programming is that, you know, if you can do one, you should be able to do ten, all right? And ten isn't necessarily ten times as hard as doing one, because most of your work is going to be figuring out the first one, all right? So we're going to make an observation after we finish, though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and copy this li Here. And here. And the only thing I have to change is submenu 2, submenu 3. And we should be in business. like a tree control in Windows Explorer.
Um, let me see if I can show you what I mean. Being a Mac user, I don't remember all the Windows features off the top of my head. But if I go into a directory, isn't doing it. Or I could have a plus to expand it or contract it. All right. Um, like notice I could click that and see everything under there. Click that and see everything under there. I could easily create my menu scheme to do that. All right. Uh, that'd be a good exercise to try to see how to do it. The first step of it would be easy. You change the on mouse over to the on click. So when they clicked on the LI, it would show the menu. The tough part would be to make it hide again. And even that's not really the tough part. What you'd have to do is you'd have to check to see if it was already visible. If it's visible, make it invisible. If it's invisible, make it visible. We'll do that next. All right. Let's, let's do that now. Forget next. Let's do that now. Okay, so we have this. We have this menu. And this is okay. Do notice one thing about this. Notice one thing. I have an awful lot of code that looks the same. All right. Now. How many of you remember the, the show Pee Wee's Playhouse? Please, someone tell me you remember it. All right. Now, remember Pee Wee had a word of the day, right? And the word of the day, every time he said it, you were supposed to scream. All right? And how cool was that? How subversive is that to make a kid show where you encourage the kid to scream while their parents are probably trying to sleep in on Saturday or whatever? All right. So, the programming equivalent of that, when you see it, you should scream, is duplicated code. Duplicated code doesn't mean the exact same code. It means really similar code where maybe only one thing is different. All right? So, what we're going to do is we're going to do this example again, and we're going to make it so that we can click it to show it and click it again to hide it. But we're going to notice where we have duplicated code, and we're going to um, see maybe what we can do to fix that. All right. Why is duplicated code bad? Well, you might make a mistake one of the times. You know, if I gave you a hundred addition problems to do, all right, just out of carelessness or your mind would wander or whatever, you, you might get one of them wrong. Right? So if you have to do the same thing over and over, like change the same block of code over and over and over again, you're bound to make a mistake. Or you're bound to forget one. You get a phone call in the middle of doing this and you think, oh, I already did that one, I'll go to the next one, you know, or whatever. And secondly, you know, it takes more time to do a hundred things than one thing. So one of the practices that we want to do for coding is all these good practices we talk about is to make your code easier to maintain. Because easier to maintain means it costs less to maintain, and it means it's less prone to errors or inconsistencies. So let's go and let's copy this, and we'll make the menu work sort of like what I just showed you there. So let me rename this to menu two. First part is easy. We get rid of the on mouse out. I'm going to change this to on click. And on click, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of the background color because that served its purpose. So on click, 
I'm going to show that submenu. And, and I'll do that for the other two as well. show it again. Well, it's already showed. Nothing's going to happen. And if I look at this, I have duplicated code. I have the same instruction written three times. What do you do when you have duplicated code? Make a function. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a function. And that function is going to accept an argument. What's an argument to a function? It's a variable. It's, it's what you want to do the action to. Think of the function as being an action that you want to do. Maybe like in a program you have calculate the square root of something. So that's the action that you're going to do. Calculate the square root. All right. The argument is what you're going to do that action to. So I can't just say, give me the square root. And you say four. Well, no. You can't just give a square root. You have to say, give me the square root of... 16 of 25. So the thing that you're going to do that action to is the argument. So I'm going to, I want to write a function that does this. When I click on it, if it's visible, hide it. If it's invisible, show it. All right? So right now, all I'm doing is showing it if I click on it. So I'll put that in there now, all right, to write my function just to get moving in that direction. And then we'll go add to it the full-blown functionality. And that's an important thing with programming. Um, try not to do everything all at once when you're writing code. Try to do just a little piece at a time, get it working, then go on to the next piece. Uh, I'll, I will see students like show me code and will ask me what's wrong. And there's like giant pieces of code. And it's like, wow, that's, that's so tough to decipher, right? If you write code, get parts one, two, and three working, pretty sure that they're working okay, then you do number four, you know, item number four, and it stopped working, you can be pretty sure it's the code you just added. Not 100% sure, but pretty sure the code you just added. So instead of looking at 100 lines of code, maybe you're looking at 10 lines of code. All right, that really narrows it down. So I'm going to write a function, and we said a function is in a script tag. And I'm going to give my function a name. And fancy word for this, not really that fancy, I guess, is toggle. So toggle menu. What does toggle menu mean? It means if it's hidden, show it. If it's shown, hide it. And here's my argument. And I'm going to call it arg. Arg means it's argument. All right? You don't have to call it arg. You don't have to call it anything. Just, you can give it a name. But I typically precede my arguments with arg, indicating th that's an argument. So when I'm looking at the code, I can see at a glance that that's an argument. So, essentially what I want to do is this. I want to go and set the style display property to block. But I don't always want to do it to menu 1. I want to do it to whichever thing got clicked on. And that's where the argument's going to come in. So 
I'm going to change this to say arg. So when I call this function, whatever submenu I give to it, that's the one I'm going to work with. That's the one I'm going to show. I'm going to change this then to say toggle menu submenu 1. So I'm saying what I want to do. I'm going to toggle this menu item. And what do I want to do with it? I want to uh, or which one do I want to do? I want to do to, uh, menu one. Now notice how this already is making my code look cleaner, right? Because instead of that big long statement, I just have just a quick line of code where it's a function. And if I'm working on something else about this page, maybe I got the toggle menu working perfectly and I don't need to worry about it anymore. If I'm doing some other maintenance to this page, it's great that I don't see that big ugly JavaScript statement stuck smack dab in the middle of my page. And it's going to become even more important when we write longer JavaScript functions, right? Because then we'd have a bunch of ugly statements in the middle of our code. All right, so I'm going to go do this. And I'm going to replace all these with the calls to the function. And I'm going to test it, right? I got two semicolons. Probably not a problem, but why tempt fate? Uh oh. Not working. Well, what do we do? Developer tools, console. I ain't getting any errors. Well, that's weird. I like the air reporting in Chrome better, so let's right now and make you stay in suspense all weekend on how to do this, but I'm not that cool of a person. What we want to write is we want to write what's called in other programming languages a conditional statement, all right, an if statement. If this is true, we do one thing. If this is true, we do something else, all right? You see that all the time in programming. If someone works more than 40 hours and they're an hourly employee, they get paid overtime, all right? If you enter a form and you don't put a value in the person's name, you get an error. If statements, all right, conditionals. If this is true, you do one thing. If this is true, you do something else. So in this case, our issue is, depending on what value this is, if we're displaying it, we want to hide it. If it's not being displayed, we want to show it. So I'm going to write an if statement here. What did I, I delete it? There we go. I'm going to write an if statement here that says if What does it mean if I say if this equals block. If that's, true. if that's true. In other words, if it's showing. So if it's showing, I want to hide it. If it's not showing, I want to show it. So, I'll go here and say, if it's 
not showing, I'm sorry, if it's showing, then hide it. Otherwise, these little curly brackets are used to sort of define a block of statements. Notice we have them for our function, we have them for our if statement. So let's analyze how this works. The function goes from here to here. That's one thing really useful because those little braces need to line up. So I put my mouse there, and I see that that one turns red, that one's turned red. Those two match the way they should. The way the statement works is it says if the value of that display property for the style equals block, then I execute this block of code, and I set it to none. Otherwise, I set it to block. So this program has two paths that can go by this function. If it's already visible, I'm going to hide it. If it's not already visible, I'm going to show it. Now notice that there's two equal signs here. The equal sign means different things in JavaScript. A single equal sign means assign a value. So give this property this value. Two equal signs is asking a question, is this equal to that? So assignment versus a question. So now when we do that, click on it, and nothing, oh, allow, all right. Click on it, it shows, click on it again, disappears. So we give the user control of whether they want to see all the menu or just see some of it. All right? And that can be a nice interface for um, something. We can even do a little better than that. I, I wish we had time, but we'll do that on Tuesday. We can put a little plus next to it indicating there's more to see. I know a lot of interfaces do that. And a little minus next to it that says, well, it's already expanded. Do you want to? Do you want to um, contract it? Do you want to shrink it again? So we'll do that on on Monday. All right. So far, all of our examples have been manipulating the HTML. I'm sorry, the CSS of the different elements. Uh, some of the examples that we go over on, on Tuesday, we'll look at actually changing the HTML. All right, because you can change both. So far, we've focused on one, but you can do more than that. All right, any questions? All right, I will go unlock lab, come back, grab my files, then be back over in lab.